There's a new book out that you're going to want to check out. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really great. It's The Populist Guide to 2020, A New Right and a New Left Are Rising is the title of the book. And it's by Crystal Ball and Sagar Njeti, if I'm saying that right. And on the line with us is Crystal Ball herself. Hey, Crystal. Great to have you with us. Hey, Tom. Great to be with you. And by the way, you, you nailed it. Sagar and Jetty, you got it perfectly. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, I, I, I tweeted, for people who follow us on Twitter, I tweeted a, video, a short video from your show. You do a TV show every morning on Hill TV, and uh, along with Sagar, I believe. And uh, it's, you, you did this deep dive into uh, how the Democratic Party would react to a, Demo to a, a Bernie Sanders candidacy that I thought was absolutely screaming brilliant. And uh, well, thank you. So, uh, you that know, means I'm, a lot coming from you. Thank you. Well, people need to go check it out. You've got a great show, and it was, it was a great rant. So let's get to your book, The Populist Guide of 2020. You talk about the new right and the new left are rising. Um, specifically, who are and what is the new left, and who are and what is the new right? Well, I think it's emerging as we speak. Um, part of why we really rushed to get this book out into the political process right now, because at our show rising, we have a very unusual dynamic. You know, I'm on the populist left. I'm a sort of Sanders-type Democrat. I like all the anti-establishment candidates in the primary. Sagar is on this new populist right that's really trying to, to find its way that, look, yes, the most visible manifestation of right now is Donald Trump. But there's a whole movement there that doesn't agree with necessarily everything Donald Trump is doing. And essentially, our thesis is, look, all the pundits got everything wrong in 2016, right? They didn't see... Sanders coming. They didn't see Trump coming. They wrote off the whole thing right up until the election results smacked them in the faces. And there's been no self-reflection about how they were able to get things so wrong. Our thesis in the book is that you can't understand what's happening in American politics and accurately predict what is going to happen in American politics without digging deep into this populist anger that is animating politics right now here in this country and really truly around the world. So as we've been watching the primary unfold at our show Rising, we've been able to accurately predict a lot of the candidates that didn't catch on, the different coalitions that supported candidates in surprising ways, candidates who ultimately dropped out. We've been able to predict a lot of those movements and ultimately the surge of Bernie Sanders because we were fil filtering it through this lens of populism. So we wanted to lay it down into sort of lessons that you could look at and use to hopefully understand American politics a little better and predict what the future might look like. And you've done a, a brilliant job of it. Um, we're talking Thank with you. Crystal Ball, the co-host of Rising on Hill TV, and the book is The Populist Guide to 2020. My, my theory on this, Crystal, and I'd love to get your your response to this. In 1976, in a, in a decision called Buckley versus Vallejo, the Supreme Court, for the very first time in the history of the United States, said that if a billionaire wants to put enough money into a politician that they essentially own that politician, um, that is no longer called corruption and it's no longer called bribery. It's called free speech under the First Amendment. It's protected by the Constitution. Two years later, a yeah. decision called First National Bank versus Bellotti in 1978, the Supreme Court extended extended that logic to corporations. This caused a flood of big money to pour into the political process. The Democrats at that point were largely supported by the labor unions, as so they kind of ignored this, uh, at least until 1992, when, when Bill Clinton said, no, we've got to get in on this corporate money thing. But um, the Democrats ignored it, but the Republicans put up a for sale sign because they were you know, in the wilderness. Jerry Ford had, had lost the election to Jimmy Carter in 76. They were freaked out. And so the, the Republican Party came, became basically the party of the, of the billionaires and corporations totally sold out. And by 92, 93, about half of the Democratic Party, in fact, arguably even three quarters at that time, I think it's about half now, decided to get in on the act and sell out. And the result of that is that Gillens and Page study in, in 2014 at Northwestern and Princeton Universities, where they found that over the last 20 years, roughly, since these two decisions, and they were amplified by Citizens United in 2010, basically over the last 20 years, the desires of the top 10% 
are likely to be made into legislation. The desires of the top 1% are almost certainly made into legislation. The desires of the bottom 90% of Americans for the last 20 to 25 years, if you look at the statistics, the surveys and the legislation that's coming out, are about as likely to be made into law as random noise. And the, yep. and the desires of the bottom 50% of Americans are less likely to be made into law than random noise. And voters have figured this out. And when, when, when Donald Trump said the system is rigged, he was right. And when Bernie Sanders said the system is rigged, he was right. And people are pissed off and they want their elected representatives to do what they want, not what the people who own them want. I lay all this at the feet of the Supreme Court, frankly, in the last book I wrote, you know, The Hidden History of the Supreme Court and the Betrayal of America. But, but that's my take on why this populist eruption is happening. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you. I think you nail it, right? It's pretty simple, ultimately. People are pissed off because Washington's not listening to them. And essentially, you have two parties that are fighting for who can do the most for the wealthiest and cut taxes the most for corporations. There's a mythology that Washington is gridlocked. And it does seem that way, especially as you watch, you know, the impeachment trial unfolding. But it's only an illusion because they are gridlocked on the things that you want them to be working on when it comes to passing trade deals that decimated our country, when it comes to banking deregulation, when it comes to endless wars. There has been very much a bipartisan consensus in this town. So our book is about what if these parties realign to the point where instead of fighting over who could do the most and gain the most wealthy donors, what if the fight was over who could actually garner the support of the working class? How could we put the working class back at the center of power in D.C.? And, you know, Tom, you're right to point out, look, my expectations for the Republican Party are very low. They've, always, they've been part of the rich for a long time. I don't expect them to be the part of the people. But that's why I focus so much en energy on the Democratic Party, because this is supposed to be the party of the people. And so when they realigned away from the working class, you basically left the working class with no real voice that would fight for their economic interests. So I think that's at the core of what this election is about. And I think it's at the core of why you have 70% of Americans who say they have a boiling anger at the political establishment. So our view is not a fringe view. It is, in fact, the mainstream view of the country, which is why your show is so popular and so su successful and important. It's why Rising has quickly found this unbelievably engaged audience and this book, which, frankly, we put out without a big rollout, you know, we've got a little tiny publishing imprint that's backing us, no PR release, no galleys went out to anyone, skyrocketed to the top five in the nation on all of Amazon because of the energy of this movement and the desire for a non-corrupt form of politics that would center the working class. 